And the lecturer is David Barad. David Barad is a partner to, um, and a director of clinical um, art and science, uh, and senior scientist in the Center of Human Reproduction in New York. And um, David is going to give us a lecture on in human growth, is human growth hormone effective in improving ovarian stimulation? Yes. Uh, it's really, uh, thank you for uh, uh, the kind introduction. And uh, thank you all for staying awake till the end of the day. It's been quite a day, uh, quite a number of wonderful speakers. And uh, I'm honored to be uh, among them. Uh, human growth hormone. OK, I have to turn this way. And the pointer, which is the pointer? OK. So um, this is my uh, conflict. No conflicts to declare in this uh, particular talk. Uh, growth <laughs> hormone is a 191 amino acid uh, single chain polypeptide uh, synthesized by the anterior pituitary gland. Um, all, until 1985, uh, growth hormone was co uh, collected from cadavers, but then there was a few cases of uh, Jakob Kreutzfeld disease. Oh, there's the slides down there. Um, that um, uh, made uh, cadaver uh, growth hormone uh, be removed from the market. Um, but uh, at the same time, they were able to synthesize growth hormone. However, that was a complex uh, synthesis. It wasn't until later that we had recombinant growth hormone. Um, growth hormone is also known as somatomedin. Um, as you know, it's, um, there is a growth hormone uh, releasing uh, hormone. There's also a um, inhibiting hormone, and so that's how it's controlled from pituitary. Um, it acts uh, chiefly on the liver to create uh, IGF-1, which is also known as somatomedin, and acts on various uh, organs throughout the body, including uh, the ovary. I keep pushing them forward instead of the thing. Um, growth hormone is not uh, approved for any use in um, uh, reproductive um, uh, treatment. Uh, it is approved uh, for treatment of short stature children, um, uh, short stature in Turner syndrome, in cases like uh, prader willi syndrome, um, and uh, also in adults who have uh, growth hormone deficiency or muscle wasting uh, as related to something like AIDS. And as I said, um, in 2006, uh, recombinant uh, growth hormone was approved, which uh, made it somewhat more affordable, um, uh, certainly um, safer than cadaver uh, hormone. And um, uh, these days, there are a few companies that are making recombinant um, growth hormone. Uh, one of the clinical issues are that um, it comes in different um, um, uh, concentrations from different companies, and so you have to keep recalculating the dose depending on which uh, growth hormone your patients can get. Um, so uh, growth hormone works via transmembrane uh, receptor. Um, it it um, uh, activates a, a tyrosine kinase um, and uh, leads to expression uh, through um, uh, IGF-1. Um, so there are growth hormone receptors uh, on granulosa cells, uh, growth hormone receptor um, um, uh, RNA. Um, messenger RNA was detected in granulosa cells in uh, dominant and antral follicles. Uh, transcripts uh, for um, growth hormone receptor uh, have been found in cumulus cells and in naked oocytes. Um, and uh, it's been shown that uh, if giving growth hormone uh, in vivo, uh, enhanced in vitro maturation in um, uh, human uh, GV oocytes uh, retrieved from small, um, small follicles. And uh, growth hormone, um, I mean, oocytes retrieved from older women um, uh, were shown to have less uh, growth hormone receptors than those of younger women. So it, it seems to be involved. Um, growth hormone um, uh, effect is uh, m uh, mediated by... Uh, release of uh, IGF-1, which is somatomedin, in, in, in the ovary. Now, it's interesting, and uh, I don't know how many of your patients come in uh, saying they read on the web that they're supposed to, uh, that they're, they want to take L-arginine. I didn't realize until I was preparing this talk that um, the reason that they're taking L-arginine is that there was evidence that L-arginine increases endogenous human growth hormone. And so uh, there have been studies that have looked at that. Of course, recombinant human growth hormone has been studied, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. 
people have tried using growth hormone releasing factor and um, pyridostigmine, um, which is a cholinesterase inhibitor um, and uh, inhibits somatostatin, which is the growth hormone inhibiting factor and therefore leads to increase of endogenous uh, growth hormone from the uh, anterior pituitary. Um, so uh, we've been talking all day, I've been hearing all day about how the follicle is acting, how important um, uh, the uh, uh, intact follicle and the active cumulus cells are in, um, in maintaining their oocyte. And, um, and, and, and so since um, growth hormone does act on uh, granulosa cells um, and uh, increases IGF-1 production, uh, it was reasonable um, uh, to think that uh, there might be some effect on the uh, oocyte um, uh, through growth hormone administration. Um, and uh, this, we're short on time. So um, actually, people have begun looking at this since uh, the early 1990s. Um, and uh, if you look at this forest plot from a uh, 2010 uh, Cochrane uh, report, um, you can see uh, that, um, oops, I did it again. Here we go. You can see that uh, most of these are showing improvement. Now, this top one is looking, this is in poor responders. So um, when they looked in um, poor responders, they were able to see uh, improvement of pregnancy rates uh, in women in these randomized trials, and of course, in live birth rate as well. And in this Cochrane review, it was only in poor responders that they were able to show a significant effect. Now, poor responders are um, part and parcel of what we see at CHR. Um, and so uh, we became uh, interested in this. Dr. Gleischer and I became interested in growth hormone. We've been talking about it for about mm, four or five years, but we didn't have the bandwidth uh, to get into it until recently, and I'll show you what we're doing in a moment. Um, interestingly, uh, and I think this is important, um, this recent article in uh, Fertility and Sterility looking at ovarian stimulation, um, how the regimen of ovarian stimulation affects oocyte and uh, embryo quality. And I think it just points out that, uh, as we've been talking today, uh, you get good uh, embryos from good oocytes. And one of the things that um, uh, they talked about in this article was using growth hormone. Now, um, you know, the nature of meta-analysis is that they go back, they find randomized controlled trials, and they plug them into the, into the bin, and they try to see um, what they might mean. Uh, so the randomized controlled trials uh, in this um, meta-analysis are basically the same as the ones in the previous. So it's not surprising that all these um, were, were there and were positive, and that the um, overall effects are still positive. But you do note that the most recent one in 2013 um, was, was not, uh, didn't add anything to this positive effect, and that those that were most positive are the ones, are the oldest ones. So I don't know if there's a difference in the growth hormone we're using or a difference in the way patients are being selected for it. Um, it could be that after the Cochrane review, which showed that it's most effective in um, uh, diminished ovarian reserve patients, people have been restricting to diminished ovarian reserve. I'm, I'm not sure, but um, you can see that it does appear to be a decreased effect. In any case, um, as Dr. Gleitscher mentioned before, uh, we have uh, reason that if this is going to be effective, uh, we wouldn't want to just begin treating in the last two weeks of treatment, but we would want to um, uh, extend that treatment uh, earlier um, so that uh, we can uh, affect the antral follicles. Um, if you don't build a better antral follicle, you're not going to uh, build a better follicle at the end of the day. And uh, that is where we are in terms of our thinking. And um, we began, as Dr. Gleischer mentioned before, uh, to treat people for six weeks um, in our trial. So this is our description of the trial on the clinical trial site. And uh, we restricted this um, trial to patients who um, had failed a, a cycle at IVF. These are people who have all been previously treated with our protocols, all had previously received uh, DHEA, um, who had all failed to produce more than uh, three, um, three or they produced three or fewer follicles, um, uh, obviously didn't achieve pregnancy. 
um, and they had to be less than 44 years old. And um, thus far, um, we, were, we wanted to target 30 participants. Our uh, rationale was that um, in using these uh, worst prognosis patients, if we could see an effect, uh, we'd have more sensitivity to, to, to see it. Um, we, uh, growth hormone has been used in various doses in the past, anywhere from um, 4 to 12 units. Uh, so we initially targeted uh, 5.7 units, which is about, which is 1.9 milligrams. Um, our patients uh, in taking uh, that dose for six weeks almost universally um, experienced uh, joint pain, um, uh, wrist swelling, ankle swelling, uh, pain in their knees. Um, so just to keep them uh, in the trial, um, we uh, decreased the dose to one milligram, which is three units. Um, and, um, uh, and this is a open label uh, randomized controlled trial. Um, these patients uh, are highly motivated for treatment. Um, they have to, uh, they know what they're taking. If they're randomized to the uh, non-growth hormone group, they're aware that they're not taking growth hormone. If they're in the growth hormone group, they're actually purchasing the growth hormone, which here in the United States is um, very expensive. It can increase uh, the cost of treatment by uh, one or, uh, one or two thousand dollars. Um, and um, thus far, uh, we've had uh, about 15 patients uh, who were, we were able to recruit into the trial um, in the, um, it's about a year or so that we've been doing the trial. Um, in that group, um, that very unfavorable group, uh, we've thus far have had one uh, pregnant patient in the treated group. That's roughly one out of seven on the treatment side, right? Um, but it's um, too, uh, too early to really talk about that in terms of um, uh, uh, any, any formal calculations. Now, as I sa said, um, we limited this to people who are less than 44 years old. Um, and so we had a number of patients who were also very unfavorable but didn't qualify for the trial because they were too old. Um, and uh, we've actually had an additional uh, 28 patients who chose to use growth hormone, although um, they didn't qualify for the trial. And, um, and in that group, we've been able to be more flexible in the way we've been administering the growth hormone. And so um, uh, we've had people who've gone through one cycle and uh, not been very successful, and they've chosen to go through another cycle. And the interesting thing that we've observed, and it's going to lead us to probably change um, or maybe start another trial, um, is that in the second cycle of growth hormone, uh, at the same relatively low dose, they start seeing more of a result. Um, and so we've had people who've gone from uh, almost no oocytes in their first trial to really excellent response. I think we got up to six um, uh, lovely embryos from some of these people. And we have um, one of these people who are really, they're older and they're the most unfavorable patients you can think of. Um, we have one ongoing pregnancy in that group right now. So I think, um, uh, as I said, it's premature to do any formal analysis of all this, but I think that it's an a interesting area. We have to decide um, uh, which uh, uh, which way we're going to go with this, um, what, which patients are most likely to be able to respond, um, and um, it'll hopefully be something we can talk to you about uh, more in the future. Um, so uh, thank you for your attention uh, this afternoon. Thanks to my coworkers, and uh, look forward to seeing more of you as this conference proceeds.